I hope we can get to a point where all of you understand why we're so proud of this agreement and why we absolutely think, believe it deserves a ratified vote. So you see the picture up behind us, another real proud moment from us, and why? Because you were there with us. Your unified voice has delivered on the content of this historical TA. You sent a clear message to FedEx that you were tired with the foot dragging. You were dissatisfied with the pace of negotiations. Pilots have stepped up and supported our efforts every time you were asked. This win is your win. Prior to the strike ballot, we were half a billion dollars apart on the final terms of this agreement. Half a billion on the final terms. The final week of negotiation, the company made an, a move on that half billion that equated to 83% of that money. That's what moved the needle. You moved the needle. You caused FedEx to come in and make that final move. And we often get asked what exactly closed out the deal. And it's a few things. One of them was the pilot participation in that strike ballot, a 99% vote in favor of a strike. The other thing that moved the needle was the mediator. The mediator made it very clear in the last week of bargaining that both parties, both parties had to bring every inch they could bring in to close out the deal. And there was no uncertainty at all when he told us that if this deal doesn't get done this week, the soonest we would see each other is after Labor Day. So there was that clear message to both parties. Both parties received that message and reacted accordingly. The last thing that moves the needle to close out this deal, because of the SPSC activities, your continued support, the effort, the strategic effort that was underway to make this an event-based process, whether it be a Wall Street Journal ad, targeted geofencing Facebook ads. But the, the final thing we believe that moved the company was their jealously guarded brand, a brand we're proud to fly with those purple tails. They guard that, they protect it, and they wanna to continue to promote it. It's a Fortune 50 company that has a respect, respected brand across the globe. That's what finally moved the needle. So it's been said, fundamentally, we know that change is a slow process, it's baby steps, but nothing worth doing ever happens easily. Nothing about this accomplishment was easy, and it took an enormous and continuous effort on all of your part, your MECs, and we've seen five different officers since Mike and I began this job, and as many different MEC reps. They continually oversaw the process. They continually endorsed and presented new obstacles, new challenges for us. And at the end of the day, the MEC came in to view the final agreement and they didn't come in 13 to 1. They came in and I clearly, there, there was an education and a final understanding of what was brought to the table. I don't know, six, seven maybe came in and were not certain which way were they gonna vote. But when they got to the end of the two day process with us, they were convinced and they endorsed this product, this TA for you to ratify. So this was our opener, this was the goal sheet, this was what we reflected upon. The MEC said back in 2019 and 20, which we developed with the MEC, but it was based on your surveys. And there was one overriding goal, and the overriding goal was this, establish an industry-leading contract that meets our members' focused priorities of enhanced retirement and pay rates with targeted quality of life improvements. The negotiating team and MEC believe that this TA is a historical win for FedEx pilots and provides your family with long overdue improvements. We heard the platitudes that went on message after message during and after the pandemic. Mr. Colloran spoke highly of the FedEx pilots and he said that the, the work that you accomplished during that time, your sacrifice ultimately would be never forgotten. The only way it can't be forgotten is by ratifying this deal. The, th the thanks and the platitudes were hollow at the time for all of us, all of us that had flown during that period. 
So let me tell you a little bit more about the TA itself. We achieved an industry-leading contract that is worth valued at $3.8 billion. That's more than $609,000 per pilot for a four and a half year deal. The increased value negotiated on behalf of the pilots through this TA make it the single largest FedEx ALPA contract ever negotiated. In fact, you can add up all three prior contracts and make an inflation adjustment for each of those and this deal is worth more than all of those combined. We understand that this TA is not all things to everyone. I don't think anybody would ever expect to bring a contract back to the pilot groups that would be that. There is no such thing as a perfect TA. And we're gonna step into some of those and we're gonna show you exactly where we negotiated with this company. That's a table of contents for the opener that we provided to the pilots and to the company. The company agreed with us on a focused negotiation. The focused negotiation was not a negotiating goal. It was not an MEC goal. It was driven by the surveys. When we asked, what do you want to open? How many items do you want to open? What's your focus area? And it was clear, unambiguous. The pilots wanted a focused negotiation, focused on the high impact items, economics, quality of life. Ultimately, we opened eight sections. Eight sections, two of them economic, four targeted quality of life, and two miscellaneous. But prior to this opener, we had to go to the, the company, we had to explain to them this was the desire of the MEC based on the pilot surveys because we couldn't have a mismatch. We couldn't walk in with a protocol and with an opener that had very focused approach and the company was coming in for an entire rewrite. That would have been disastrous. The company agreed with the focused approach and they knew exactly what we were coming after. They knew already the cornerstone. We had been engaged in the fight with them going back to 2017. We, we brought in the variable benefit plan in 2018. But again, this was based off of the pilot's information. We continued to poll the pilots. In fact, 11 polls, both phone and online polls, going back to 2018, 11 total surveys and what happened in each one of those surveys that Chris talked to you about. Each and every one of those, retirement was top. 87% of the pilots continuously said retirement is our number one issue. So the MEC develops an opener with the cornerstone of retirement and compensation and quality of life, but targeted quality of life fixes, largely driven by the pandemic as we were in negotiations. So did the focused agreement pay off? The slide I'm showing you right now presumes on the top FedEx. You see the, in gold the amount of time we negotiated. The red line is the line that will move along with negotiations. It presumes and shows the length of the duration if the agreement is ratified. But I want to point out a couple things. The, the focused negotiation did pay off. Prior negotiations lasted much longer, but part of the reason why the pilots wanted this focused negotiation was because of that duration. That duration right there, a six year duration, now we're in the eighth year of that based off of this TA. So the only way we could shrink that footprint, and the pilot, you, you all know this, the only way we could shrink the footprint if we went in and had a focused negotiation. Six years was obviously, based off of the surveys, too long. Some could argue that it got us through the pandemic while the others had to stop negotiating during that time frame. But I want to point out a couple things. Look at the United deal. And I, I really hope those guys come to an agreement in short order. But there's a deal that was rescinded and not ratified by the United Airline pilots. The blue portion is their agreement, that four year deal. Now they're in their fifth year of negotiations. That's tough to recover from. It makes our six-year deal start to look very short. The American deal up here, you can see the American timeline. They've been in negotiations for a long time. Again, they have an AIP, an agreement in principle to their pilots. They're still working on full language on that agreement, trying to turn that into a tentative agreement. So what else inherently came from 
and did we benefit from this focused negotiation? Because we were able to focus on fewer items, fewer sections open, fewer items within the section, we're actually able to craft full language with our attorneys, full language proposals. We could work out any intent issues through that negotiation. M many of these negotiations you see up here, because of the amount and the volume that they negotiate in and the timeline, they have to present sometimes just assumptions walking in on the items they want to hit, or at least a level of detail that just isn't enough to get your hands wrapped around it, potentially bulleted or heavy bulleted openers. We walked in with full language proposal, as did the company. So we're able to produce along the way once we ratified and we updated you. Every time we got a new TA, we put it on the website. And we know there was good put on the website for the MEC. So the MEC was fully informed of every TA as, it, as we agreed to it with the company. So that created available time for us to continue to build up the education that we put on the website. So we were ready to go once the TA was totally uploaded. The podcasts are up there, the videos are up there. The entire TA is up there. The only thing that was not full language at the end of the agreement was section 28. Section 28 was heavily bulleted, heavily, almost full language, including the market-based cash balance plan, LOA. That has some unique transition features, but that was also uploaded for every single MEC rep that, that looked at this TA a couple of weeks ago. That's been up there for a long time. So the idea was to get this compression, the time compression down and not expose ourselves to any more time or delay in getting a final deal done. So the, the takeaway here, our process was correct. We kept it, the new agreement well under six years. The company wanted to open, or they proposed a six-year deal. We ended up with a four-and-a-half-year deal. So the last thing I want to talk about before I uh, bring Mike up is how the deal was structured, because I think some people look maybe at um, you know, the Delta deal that's out there, and, and there's some head-scratching going on saying, well, how do they produce those pay rates as high as they did? Um, the structures in each of these negotiations are very different, extremely different based off of the surveys. We didn't negotiate Delta's deal. Delta didn't negotiate our deal. We put the right deal in front of the FedEx pilots for you, the one that you wanted. Some people questioned the IPA and why they had such a high ratification of their extension. I think it was 97%, extremely high, because it was the right deal for the IPA pilots in that point in time. Who are we to say that that wasn't the right deal for them? It, was, it, it obviously was. But the Delta deal, in terms of structure, they put, their value was an increase of about 34% on comp, compensation, and fringe. 12%, which is a high number in retirement, very high number, but 12% in retirement. Ours, at a minimum, at a minimum, because of the pay compression, is 30% in the pay side of the equation. And we put 30% value on the retirement side of the equation. So significant value into that deal. At the end of the day, the unity and the direction and drive that we had from the retirement piece created 44% increased value over the current contract. We don't have a moment in time in our history where we've added that much value into the contract ever on retirement. In fact, the number's about 2 to 4% of added value. But we added $1.67 billion to this retirement. We are absolutely proud of that retirement piece. It has provided and will provide retirement security for pilots for generations to come. And we're gonna talk about that more with you here shortly. Mike. Thanks, Pat. So the slide you have before you is from our openers. I'll give you a second to read it before I begin. I've been involved in pilot benefits now for about 30 years or so, working both on your behalf as well as some of your contemporaries at other airlines. For us, for me, 
Achieving these retirement benefits for you is personal. So today, I'm both humbled and proud to present to you the best retirement package in the airline industry. This effort significantly improves our retirement uh, benefits. It began in 2016, as Pat said, shortly after the ratification of the 2015 agreement. In addition to our MEC team members, Kevin and R and I, Brandy and Benefits, we had our ALPA professionals at the team, Kathy's in the room, Liz. We also added a group of actuarial consultants to our team some of the best in the country. October 3 has developed hundreds of these market-based cash balance plans and was instrumental in assisting us in achieving our basic, our basic plan design. Uh, the Siegel Group assisted us with the costing and the valuing of our legacy pension plan. Chiron worked with us on both these issues, but also developed the modeling that we used in order to evaluate our benefit proposals. So the legacy plan is a defined benefit plan or DB plan. We use those interchangeably. The benefit is achieved through the benefit formula. Here we have 2% times the final average years of service capped out at 25 years max. Our benefit is produced using the highest of three formulas, which I will not get into, uh, all subject to a 260,000 final average earnings limit. The PRSP is defined contribution or DC plan, meaning the contribution itself is fixed, but the benefit can vary. The PRSP receives a 9% company contribution subject to IRS limits. Under the new TA, the FAE increases to $325,000, producing a maximum benefit of $162,500 for pilots retiring under this plan as of May 30th of this year until December 31st, 2024. So you can see beginning 2000, I'm sorry, let's try that again. Beginning in January 1st, 2025, the FAE limit increases to $330,000, which would produce a max benefit of $165,000. And beginning January 1, 2027, the FAA limit increases to $338,000, resulting in a max benefit of $169,000. This slide depicts the retirement improvement uh, using the new FAE caps. I'll just get you a second to look at for those that are, you, that are more visually oriented. So the market-based cash balance plan itself operates on a fiscal year, which will be June 1 through May 31st. But the company is going to establish the plan using a short plan year beginning January 1st of 2025 that will run through May 31st. Then it will transition over to the fiscal year. The plan provides for in-service distributions beginning at age 59 and a half. The catch is, though, that when you take an in-service distribution, you have to take the entire balance from your account. The plan also provides for LTD and military leave benefits. If you look at this in the CBA, it may look a little bit cryptic when you read it, but the plan contributions, while expressed as a percentage of your LTD benefit, are actually tied to 85% of the earnings used to calculate that benefit. So it's 85% of that highest 12 of last 36, and the 11% number is tied to that number. But when you translate it to the LTD benefit, you're going to see some strange numbers, but they're going to be above that 11%, obviously. Uh, the normal retirement under the plan is age 62, just like the pension. But in this plan, like your DC plan, the age you retire doesn't really matter. You terminate employment at any age, and you can take 100% of your benefit. Regardless of when you retire, though, uh, benefits must... Uh, be distributed by age 65, so you can't hold on to them longer like you can in the pension. Distributions must be no less, though, than the total 
of all compensation credits made to the plan. So let me say that again. The company is on the hook. You have a floor benefit in this plan of all those 11% contributions that the company ever made to the plan, regardless of whatever rate of return occurs. So pilots already in the pension plan, that should be most everybody in this room, will have a one-time election to move from the pension to the market-based plan. If you do not make an election for some reason, your, fault, your default benefit will be to remain in the pension plan. That's the default. If you elect to move to the market-based plan, your years of the service in the pension will freeze when you transition over to whatever years you've accrued, right? And also, if you move, a 290, let's try it, let's put it in dollars, a $290,000 FAE limit will apply to your years of service in the plan. And I want to be clear, you will not then participate in the scheduled pension increases that I mentioned later. You will have a $290,000 fixed cap. So years of service will freeze, your earnings will not. If you don't have 290 yet, you can get there. Some additional enhancements that were negotiated, the benefit from the advance notice of retirement, can't say that very quickly, was improved with an increase to the maximum available benefit. Recall, it's the lower of three tests. For the earnings test, the previous threshold was two times the prior pension FAE limit of 260,000 or it was 520. So everything over 520 counted towards that uh, benefit. But it was tested against an earnings threshold of two times, let's try that, 50% of your DSA balance times your last hourly rate. And then the third test was the uh, 110, and that's now going to be 150. So you'll get the, the least of those three numbers. All right, and this is important because you know, we all received calls and, and people were uh, obviously a bit distraught as, as we came to uh, closing out negotiations, that this TA created the flexibility for pilots who revoked their December 2002 notice of advanced retirement. Uh, we negotiated with a company that a pilot may resubmit a new advance notice for age 65 or De December 31st retirement, and pilots who do resubmit a proper notice will receive the Section 28F bonus money. All right, so before continuing now, let's review some of the features of the market-based plan uh, that made that plan an attractive alternative to replace our pension. Again, from our opener, we wanted to create a sustainable balance between defined benefit and defined contribution plans, and we wanted to maximize retirement benefits by prioritizing tax advantage options. So, to summarize, we wanted to take advantage a tax advantage balanced solution that was both durable for us and sustainable. So in order to keep that defined contribution defined benefit balanced, we needed a defined benefit solution. Unlike the legacy pension that has a fixed FAE limit, the cash balance plan has a cost of living increase built into its limit. Also distinct from the legacy plan, the market-based plan has no years of service limit. As well, the benefit is available as a lump sum, which permits your surviving spouse or your heirs to inherit the, retire, the entire remaining benefit. And perhaps most importantly, the chance of this type of plan ever being subject to an ex distress termination are exceptionally low. This actually sounds actually more like a DC solution. And if you came to that conclusion, you're correct, but stay with me. This slide illustrates one other reason why we selected the market-based plan. For illustration purposes here, we're assuming that the pilot earnings are equal to or greater than the 2023 IRS earnings limit of $330,000. Here the contribution limit is calculated at 20% of that contribution limit. I'm sorry, I'll try that again, of the earnings limit. And that would be $66,000 in 2023, to put numbers on it. So 330,000 is the earnings limit, 20%, 66,000, that's what you could contribute to your defined contribution plan in total. So the bucket on the left 
depicts the maximum annual contribution percentage. The picture shows all the PRSP contributions up to their individual limits. And what can go into this plan are company contributions, 9%. Piled elective deferrals, including Ross, are not directly tracked as a percentage, but they're worth about 7% of that earnings limit. Sick bank overages are worth about 8% if you're fortunate enough to have them. Alternatively, you could make after-tax contributions to this plan of about 4%. So if we do the math, starting from the bottom, you would have 9% plus 7% if you had sick bank money, about 8% or 24% of that compensation limit, and you would obviously be over. If you do not have sick bank money, you would have 9%, you could contribute 7 you could contribute additional four after taxes to reach that 20% mark. The point is, is that we can now reach the IRS contribution limit. If we were to add that market-based money 11% by structuring it as a DC contribution, we would have to pour that into the bucket and we would displace everything but the company contributions into cash. So if you look at it, we have the 11% on the right, We'd have those company contributions at the bottom of that bucket. It'd be 11 plus 9, that would be our 20, and we would displace all pilot elective deferrals and all sick bank money out into taxable income. That is not what we wanted to do. By using a defined benefit plan, contributions then do not impact what the pilot can uh, put into the uh, defined contribution plan with regard to elective deferrals or sick bank. And by using this solution, we can leave room for additional contributions made by you, and total deferrals can then amount to 31% of the IRS limit, or $102,300. And to be clear, if we just use a defined contribution solution, we could still get that 11, that 20% of company money, that would be the 11 plus nine, 11 market-based cash balance plan, 9% company contributions, but we would be cheating you out of room that you could make yourself, if you so choose to do, of making those 7% electives and making those 4% uh, or those, those sick bank contributions. We wanted to leave money there for you so that you were not stuck at 66,000. You could put in up to 120, 120, yeah, $102,300 and that index is up. That was just a 2023 example. I wanna provide a little more color and detail on the summary that Mike just provided for you. Um, you know, we had a, a number of challenges here on the retirement piece, and um, ultimately, we present you with this TA, but, but how did we actually get here on it, and why was it so hard to move the needle in 2006, again 2015, and some would say 2011, because we did make an attempt there. So the challenge is, it is on the pension side, the legacy pension, the funding obligations that live and exist in there, and largely driven by the 2006 Pension Protection Act. Those changes really gave the employees much more protection um, within that pension world, but it came at a cost, and the cost was substantial to corporations that still have these legacy pensions. Um, and that's the funding requirements, their obligations, both cash ac accounting obligations, and what, what it means to them when they make a change in that pension is significant. Um, so we ran into that and there was no way to avoid those, those really magnified changes. And th what I mean is we try to produce a dollar of benefit on that legacy pension, but it takes an awful lot of money, both from a balance sheet perspective, from the company to get that extra dollar of benefit. Um, it was an enormous obstacle for us and it required a tremendous amount of money um, and the company takes a hit ultimately. They've already reported in their recent um, Q4 2023 earnings some contributions to those pension obligations. And the reason that, again, that it's so expensive is when you make a change like that and you have 5,500 eligible pilots for that change, you make a move as large as we did every pilot in that uh, pension has to get recalculated at the new higher FAE limit. And that's why it is so substantial. That's why the company pushes back. That's why they approach us with DC money. That's why in 2015, they offered a DC only plan to
to transition away from the legacy plan, essentially trying to lock down and freeze out that plan at $130,000, but dangled a really big carrot out there for new hire pilots that was a DC only fix. But look, the minute you take your, your benefits and you carve out one entire qualified bucket, now you're down to DC only, that really limits your ability to put qualified money away for your future benefit. And what we have is high income earners, very high income earners who are pulling away from their retirement benefit level. And that was, a, that was really the, the key reason for the work that we did was to identify how can we actually go in and address the pension concerns that the company brought to the table time in and time again, 2006, 2015, the same exact uh, headwinds that the company faced in those um, negotiations, we would be faced with unless we came up with some alternative paths. That put us, number one, on the path of understanding what we have in the current pension and how much does a cost or an improved benefit um, create for an obligation for the company and understand why they don't want to do that. The second thing was, well, what else can we do to provide another qualified pension out there? And there, there's limited options available. Um, that put us on the path of the variable benefit plan. Ultimately, we presented that to the company in 2018, but we had an awful lot of feedback from the pilots about that, that actually changed and improved, and we saw areas of concern. We had pilots that came up and said, look, I'm a quality of life pilot. I don't, I don't necessarily like this idea of the variable benefit plan. Just go ahead and fix what you have in the pension. Um, pilots didn't want to be forced into any plan change. They wanted to, be, they wanted to make the decision. Some pilots have already planned on that $130,000 and they were worried that we would go in and actually reduce the benefit that they could potentially earn, which isn't allowable under law. So it presented um, an enormous challenge. The other piece of this is we can't just pick one demographic and say, Mike's gonna win or the 25 year old new hire is gonna win and then we put all the benefit towards that one individual. The MEC tasks us with making the benefit dispersal as equal as we can possibly do. And what's, our, what's the range for us? Well, I think about 25 years old is the beginning point and somebody that's just about to turn 65. So we have a 40 year spread on a benefit that we're trying to change and we're looking at both sides of the equation. We're looking at the defined contribution and we're looking at the legacy pension. We say, well, how do we go about managing that? And we've seen what partial fixes look like in 1999, 2006, we had pay service multipliers put in because we had a defined contribution plan that started in 99 at 5%. That thing has continued to grow effectively through negotiations. The prior teams have done that and each contract builds upon that. But now we're at 9% on the defined contribution. But every time you take and make a 1% additional increase in that defined contribution, well, what are you gonna do on the, the pension side? Because 25, 30 year old, 40 year old pilot, they enjoy way more benefit on that 1% bump as opposed to somebody in their late 50s or 60s. So it presents a very unique challenge for us in how you deal with that. And the pay service multipliers in the prior agreements did that. It offset for the older pilots getting near retirement, that DC improvement. And we said we can't keep doing these Band-Aid fixes, number one, they're ineffective because it's a snapshot in time. You either fell on that chart or you didn't. And if you didn't, you were out of luck and you might be out of luck by one day. And we have plenty of pilots there. So we said we need a more permanent fix to the legacy pension, but we also need a more durable pension plan for new hires. Um, so that's how we ended up in the market-based plan. And of course the company, to be clear, the company didn't open their arms and say, come on in with your market-based cash balance plan. And oh, by the way, here's your pension fix. Quite the opposite was true at the initial days of that negotiation regarding the pension, regarding that legacy plan. The company would have loved to have frozen that plan at the current benefit level and again offer a DC only solution. And we know the DC only solution doesn't work. We only need to look at our brothers and sisters over at Delta and United um, American to see what's happened there with either planned bankruptcies, planned distress terminations. And what have they been trying to do during this negotiating cycle? They have been trying to move from their DC only bucket
because they have the same problem of headroom that Mike talked about. They're maxing out that money in that bucket. Some deploy it and after, um, once they hit the bucket, they have cash over the cap, but that's money tax at the highest tax bracket. You can do that in a, in a um, pay rate. So what they've tried to do now, um, in, in to, with some success, is to create a new pension over there. And their new pension, the market-based cash balance plan, their funding mechanism looks entirely different than ours. Um, ours has direct funding from the company. But the other piece that I want to share with you, though, is what does this do moving forward? Well, the albatross that Chris referred to is that legacy pension funding and the obligation there on trying to move the needle on the benefit and how much it takes from the company versus the market-based cash balance plan where moving the needle 1% in the future for pilots that are in that plan is relatively easy. It's very similar to the defined contribution plan fix. And that, that improvement, almost all, every single penny that the company puts into that actually goes into the pilot's pocket in an actual benefit. It doesn't get washed out in PBO, or projected benefit obligations. It doesn't get washed out in accounting and other obligations. So it's really a very durable plan moving forward, one that's much easier to understand and has a lot of unique features that I think the younger generation of pilots really are looking forward to. That's the portability feature. The fact that if they want to take their money at 59 and a half, that lump sum, that's very easy to do. But what we've done here as well is position the pilots in a very favorable position, very favorable moving forward. So after this negotiation is complete and your next round of bargaining, now the new negotiating team, the new MEC and the pilots will get to say, where's our focus? And if you want to go and add another percent on the DC side, we haven't disconnected the pilots on that DC. We kept them very much in balance. We didn't say, well, th this group gets a higher DC. Everybody's connected on that. And the market-based cash balance plan, if they decide to make an improvement there, that's a durable, long-lasting improvement. And the improvement, the actual contribution will continue to increase as inflation goes up because that moves the IRS limit on that. And as the IRS limit increases, it matches lockstep with our actual compensation. So unlike the legacy plan that was locked down at a $130,000 benefit, where it was originally intended to produce a 50% income replacement, for the new hires today, had we not done anything with that plan, if we weren't successful there, that 50% replacement ratio for a new hire today was dropping down to 16%. 16% replacement ratio. That is certainly not the case in this market-based plan. So we think from a leverage standpoint, moving forward, you have obviously other priorities that you'll be tasked with, other issues that come to the forefront and you don't have to leverage near as much as what we did in this contract negotiation to move the needle on retirement from here forward. So we're gonna move into compensation. So one of the comments, or I guess uh, things that we hear common out there right now has to do with inflation. Um, you know, did we match or didn't we match inflation? Um, and that our pay rate is a pay cut because we didn't match CPIU. Um, our numbers would prove otherwise. I'm gonna share those with you. November 21, if you measured it, it uh, the pay rate, if you were just to match inflation, it would have been $367 an hour. If you go back to November 15, um, the last contract, it would have been $367 again. Um, our DOS top of scale is $382. So just to give you an example here, the, this is the pay rate. If you go all the way back to our very first negotiated agreement and where the pay rates were first established by a union, uh, the FPA days, uh, you can see the inflation marker there and then you can see the various um, collective bargaining agreements. And what you see um, in particular is where our CBA hits the inflation line and, and where it hit in 2015. Um, in 2006, you can see the drop below inflation. And I'm gonna try and not blind Rich here. But what happens when you go into negotiations, if you go into prolonged negotiations, you clearly have a problem there 
with even normal inflation rates, 2.7% or so. And that's during that time you're crossing under the inflation mark. Um, and the longer you're in negotiations, the further you drive potentially on the negative side of that and you're reducing your purchasing power. On the, if we measure it from the 2015 CBA, um, again, what you'll see here is our amendable date crossing over inflation and we've crossed over and under inflation and then the 2023 TA brings us up and over inflation. So move, and we, we can talk about, obviously we'll have some questions on that later, but um, one of the things, uh, again, that we try to do in negotiations, just like we did with the market-based cash balance plan, um, we really tried in every area we could was to set things on an autopilot. Once you negotiate it, if you have a good formula in place, if the company will agree to it, and you're confident in the numbers, then it marches along with the growth in the pay rates. So new hire compensation is certainly one of those areas. The current book for a new hire pilot today is $4,000 a month. We are virtually last among our peers, uh, UPS through the major airlines. So what we did was we matched similar to the other industry peers here, and we went to a 2.25 credit hour per day. So on a 2.25 credit hour per day, we moved away from the salary, so we had to make some language here, the internal to section three, so that the uh, new hires would also get an end of month paycheck, because that wasn't actually in the language. But on a four week bid month, with the date of signing pay rates, our new hires would have new pay for the month, on it based off of 63 credit hours, that's a 46% increase and it's $5,826. If you go to the end of the scale, the DOS plus 42 on a four week bid month, that pilot's narrow body pay rate at that point is $108.93. So that pilot on a four week bid month achieves $6,863. 72% increase there. If you take a quick look at the narrow, at the wide body numbers at, um, at the bottom, just to give you the top end of the scale, um, the increase is 114%. That's based off of a five week bid month, DOS plus 42, the rate for the wide body FO that they hire is 108.93. That equates to $8,578 by the end of this agreement. So again, this is one of those things where we're really trying hard to pull anything off of future negotiations that we could. It could easily be changed. I mean, it's gonna change automatically as pay rates increase, but the, the actual credit hour uh, could be adapted in the future. So let's move over to the pay rate scale. So the pay rates, we have five raises over three and a half years. The implications on the pay rates are throughout the CBA, and, and there's a long list. We certainly can put it up on the website, but pay rates implicate things such as draft, volunteer, SDP, disruption, overages. There are a number of items within and throughout the contract, section four, section 11, section 25, that, implicate, that are implicated by an improvement on the pay rate. So what you see here is a date of signing of 14% and just six months later, the 3% providing a 17.1% cumulative. 12 months later, a 4% increase so inside of 18 months in data signing, we're at 22.1% compounded. 12 months later, another 3% compounded is 25.7. And then finally at the 42 month point, or at, at February 27, another 3% with 29.6% compounded. So we're gonna show you some assumptions. And we had good feedback in, the, in our last road show, and one of the, one of the questions um, from the pilots were, look, show us your math. How do you get to the, you know, the pay rate charts that you have up here? And we're happy to provide those. We're gonna load these up on the FDX TA website. Um, Liz and her team, ENFA, obviously worked um, diligently providing these assumptions. There's too many to obviously kind of read through each one. You're happy what we'll do is provide it on the website, but just the one that stands out, I think, as you look at the 777, the one that I think has garnered some of the questions is, well, how do you show a 777 pay rate that ends up on the compensation side looking higher? 
And that's because we used our actual average credit hours in the bid pack, and we backed it up against our W-2s. And we know that typically 777 pilots make anywhere from 20 to 25 percent more, but 20 percent more than the differential from the 767. And we know that the FOs on that side of the equation are up around 26 percent higher. The W-2s are consistent in backing this up. When you look at it, when we've looked at all the averages for, throughout the entire fleet in, in each crew position, and the 777 rates are solidly there. Um, what you'll see as well, though, after the 777 rates, and we'll, we'll show you the comparison here in a second, will be the 767 rates, and everything else in our fleet is based off of 78 hours per month. That's close to 5.4 credit hours per day. 72 hours in a four-week bid month, 90 in a five-week bid month. So 936 hours. The others you'll see, Delta, American, United, are based off of 936 hours based on their mon monthly average line value. The only outlier there is the UPS rate, which looks high for a lot of people when you look at their annual comp. And their comp is high. But theirs is based, we use their TA that they presented, and we just use their number. Um, again, we're trying to just use the, um, the numbers that their own negotiating committee uh, put out there. Then after that, what you'll see is vacation hours at the top of the chart, and the vacation hours are simply what we have. I want to be clear, there's a lot of confusion when pilots see that vacation hour on top of the comp numbers. Those vacation hours are your credit hours. That's what doesn't mean you have to sell back that vacation to, to actually have that value in the compensation. It's how much do you get credited when you go and use your vacation to remove those trips. And far and away, we had the best vacation when we started we have better vacation now. We end up with 216 hours of potential hours there at the highest pay rate, and that's the number you'll see. UPS has 175 hours. Delta made some great strides in their TA by increasing substantially their vacation. At the end of the deal, they're about up to 160 hours, at 160 hours. And then the retirement compensation numbers. Um, there was a lot of ways we could look at this, but we're trying to do apples to apples on it. So we don't have in the compensation, we don't show anything in there under the actual benefit, what we're showing, uh, the pension benefit. What we show is the market-based plan and the defined contribution plans. Those two benefits combined. And ours run up to the IRS limit. So I'll step through those real quick. So the DOS earnings comparison for the 777 top rate captains. And then you see in the green, the vacation pay. That's based off the DOS rates today. And the $66,000, that's based off of the IRS limits that are in place today. And we've maxed out every one of the, the comparisons, so Delta, American, UPS. So uh, I just wanted to, to point out, to, you know, when Pat talked about these 777 pay rates, um, we did look at W-2s, and that's a 20% premium. Uh, but we wanted to be careful with that because we know that um, triple sevens typically have more carryover um, and, and a lot more block hours. So we, we were like, is that really more pay per day? Are, those, are they really earning more pay for less work or for the same amount of work, actually? So we, we went and, and looked at the bid packs and included block, hour, uh, block hours over eight. And our triple seven pilots earn about 6.48 credit hours per day. Every other um, seat at the airline is averaged, averages out to about 5.4 credit hours per day. So that's a 20% premium in pay per day. And that's what we use to um, come up with these numbers. And we backed that up with the W-2 data, and we backed it up. If you go and look at the bid packs over the last six months, the 777s are at 89 point something for their average BLGs. If you add in block over eight, it works out to pretty close to 93. So we looked at this several different ways. All the numbers kind of converged on this 20% premium that we came up with for the 777. So I just want to point out that this, is, this isn't because they're flying more. This is, this is for the same amount of work that the 777 guys are earning this amount of money. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate it. So one of the things is, as I'm here, just on the 777 pay rate, um, what I want to mention is it was one of the challenges that comes in when we're trying to compare our uh, pay banding to any other airline. The company, of course, is going to always try and maximize their, um, what our pay looks like compared to, and they want to always typically go, go to UPS because they view us as being in the 
cargo industry, and they try to always exclude the passenger industry until it becomes a point in time at which it would be convenient for them to do that. We push back on both of those arguments. Um, and we have a unique challenge, though, and it was presented to the MEC. said, look, we, we have two bands. We have a narrow body band, our 7573 band, and then we have the wide body band, which 85% of our pilots are in. Um, and so what we did was we started negotiation with very high numbers on those pay rates. We had no idea what the delta numbers were going to be at, the, at that point, but they were commensurate with what they ended up bargaining. And, and we kept telling the company, if you delay, these other agreements will come out. And they kept saying, yeah, but we only need to match our competitor. We only need to match UPS. And of course, in their opening proposal, their opening stance was, let's come in and offer something less than UPS. So of course, that was a laugh. I mean, that was not going to happen. But what we also said was, well, look, you also have 757 pilots at UPS in that single pay band. So if you want to do that, are you willing to move everybody up into the band? And they probably would, but it wouldn't have been at the pay rates we received on the higher wide body rate. So the other side of the coin is, well, we only have the two bands. How do we compare out to the pay rates to the passenger carriers who have, some of them have three essentially wide body. They're not actively in place because it's like a 380 rate, but really two wide body rates. And if you look at where we hit ultimately on the pay rate number, if you look and take their two highest rates, it's within dollars of that average for Delta and United or American. Um, but it's a unique challenge, and, and the only way we could have gone after and attacked that triple seven pay rate was breaking out our fleets. And we presented that as an option to the MEC as one way to go about hitting this problem. MEC was not interested in doing that. Their feedback was pretty direct. Like, no, the pilots don't know about it. They don't have time to bid. They don't know going into this negotiation that could be a thing. Would your bidding have been different? So what does it mean here for us today is that going forward, that has to be part of the discussion after this TA is ratified. I think there has to be a working group set up from the MEC level to say, do we really want to go into this pay banding issue? We tried when the 777 came on property to get that high, higher pay band on the triple. We weren't effective doing it. And the MEC's decision was, we, we can't go and fight that battle as well right now, and the pilots don't even know about that battle. So our, their direction to us was stick with what you're doing, go after the highest pay you can get for 85% of the pilots, and continue with the narrow body rate. But I do think it's something that we have to engage, we have to survey the pilots on and decide if that's something we want to do. I think the MEC was comfortable with it because of what Rich just explained. The W-2s and the actual block over eight the actual compensation kind of shows, you know, is shown here on this slide. So maybe it's not as important. So if you just move forward to the DOS plus 42, again, you'll see the movement on the vacation pay. That's a direct result of the highest pay rate. And then you'll see movement on the IRS max, uh, max rate. The cap there is $73,000. And that's based off of, we received this from our actuaries at Alpa National. They run IRS assumptions based on 2.4% inflation. So today, that IRS cap is $330,000. That's how you come up with 66000 on the prior slide. You move forward 42 months, and the estimate now in 2027 is $365,000. So if you take $365,000 and you multiply it by 20%, that's how you end up with that $73,000. The rest of the slides are consistent here with the 777. DOS on the 7.6 captain rate compared to Deltas, Americans, Uniteds, and UPSs with 85 credit hours. DOS plus 42, same thing. Again, using 78 credit hours uh, per month for everyone else except UPS. We heard had some feedback that we had some 7.5 comparisons to 7.3. Um, it was all 7.3 sevens from the MEC. They said, no, we'd really rather have you show the 7.5s, even though Delta and um, American have a, a specific 7.5, 7.6 rate. That's not a blended rate that you see down at the bottom there. That is actually, 
that specific rate for the 7576 fleet type. There's Hawaiian A321s in there. Um, looks like, oh, that's JetBlue 320, Alaska 73 rate. United, again, they're, uh, we, they're in still negotiation. So obviously, I think the expectation there is United will certainly come up and match the Delta rates and then Southwest rates. Then the DOS plus 42. So what else did we do here? Well, one of the things certainly was the company's actions in the past uh, six to eight months with their announcement of their drive and network 2.0 um, was enough to cause us to come back and meet with the MEC and discuss the implications for scope, um, what that would look like if we actually needed to pull that thing back after being a TA, what the company reaction would be if we pulled the TA off of the the shelf and say, we need to reopen, what would the company reaction be? We said, well, it's not going to be good. Um, likely, it's going to cause a significant delay. We don't exactly know the, the entirety of the direction the company's going. What we do know is they're making, and they need to make, this airline more efficient, and they're doing it in a way that's blending the ground and express networks. So we said, well, look, we think we have a faster way to achieve some ability to deal with this issue for the pilots that got hired here since 2015, and there's about 3,100 of you. Um, it's a big deal. It's a big deal because you came here, you may have not gone to Delta, you may have not gone to United or American. In fact, you may have left those airlines to come here. And it was extremely important that this MEC deal with this issue directly and head on. And so what we said we could do, and this was very late in negotiations, this was not on the table, not even a concept discussed in a hypothetical we said, well, look, let's see if we can't go in and accelerate their, their pay rate. Let's go in and accelerate from 15 years to 12. Let's put us on the standard with the rest of the industry. And of course, we knew the company was going to not welcome that move. Everything they do, they keep comparing themselves to, to UPS, and they're saying, look, UPS is handing it to us right now from a business perspective, and we're trying to stay competitive with them. So why would we give FedEx pilots this advantage of a 12-year top of scale compared to our nearest competitor, UPS, that has 15. And we said, because you really messed up right now. You, you, your senior executives have thrown out enough information that you have everybody wondering the direction of this company. We wonder how small is the airline going to get over the next two, three years? Are we, get, are we 500 overstaffed? Are we 1,000? So we said, you need to deal with those issues directly. So. Pilots came here with an expectation of a career progression that now was not materializing. And it became a fact once they published the system bid. And the system bid was not welcome news for anyone. We said, well, look, let's at least deal with the career progression on one side of the equation. We'll deal with the, top of, we'll deal with the pilots retiring on the other side. We can have a more immediate impact with this TA when this is ratified to reverse the trend by taking pilots off the top and accelerating the pay scale at the same time. So how do we do it? <clears throat> well, we layered them in over our DOS. We combined our top rate 15th year to include the 14th year at the data signing. At the data signing plus six month, we again collapse 15 and 14 to now include the 13th year. And then at the DOS plus 18, we collapse it all down to the 12th year. So it's a historical pay rate move for us, and it's set again in stone the pay scale from here on out that it's 12-year top of scale. So what does that mean in real numbers for pilots who are in the demographic? And what we've done is we picked a pilot that's at uh, date of hire was February 2015 with eight years of service. And we're not upgrading any of these pilots. You're seeing the pilot staying static in that seat. So the wide body captain right now with eight years of service their current pay, pay rate is $314.23. That pilot, by the time they get to the last pay increase, will receive a 38.3% compounded pay increase. So their pay rate ends at 434. The wide body first officer, same demographic. Today they're at $210. And in, by the end of the contract, they're gonna be at 
$308.17, a 46% increase. The narrow body captain, $269 today with a 39% increase by, the, by DOS plus 42 ends up with a $374 increase. And then lastly, the narrow body first officer who has today a $181 per hour rate ends up at $271 per hour, a 49.4% increase, nearly $100,000 more per year. So starting out with scope, I just thought we'd start with what's in the current CBA. Uh, we've said this over and over again, the current CBA um, is not a hard limit on wet leasing. There are penalties if they go over the limit for free wet leasing. Um, the language is, uh, it's, it can be hard to read. We understand how people came up with that interpretation. Uh, but basically, the, the legal concept here is that all the language in this has to mean something. And if there's a hard limit on, on uh, wet leasing, then there would be no reason to even have the penalty part of this, this paragraph here. Um, and uh, as we, you can see the un underlying portion there, then the company shall pay. That is what happens if they go over the limit. It's not a situation where we can take them to court and get a cease and desist. The court's going to go, this is it. This is the penalty. They have to pay that. Um, this language, uh, not in exactly this form, but in close to this form, goes all the way back to 1999. There's been no uh, disagreement between uh, ALPA and the company about uh, the penalty being the remedy for this, for this wet leasing. We could kind of see that. This is a, a company's letter dated February 8th. And for those of you that read the column last, that we put out last night, this is, this is the same document. Um, it, this was the first wet lease penalty after the, the 2015 deal was ratified. Uh, and you can see in this, the, the first sentence there to calculate the net gain of trunk aircraft scheduled to be added and brought into service. In a calendar year, we compare the number of aircraft available for revenue service on those two dates. Well, those two dates are listed in the next paragraph. As December 31st, 2014, 339 jets. December 31st, 2015, 343 jets. Net gain of four. Then they go on to say that um, they've attached the, the relevant uh, historical snapshots so we can verify that data. And then the final paragraph says the company must pay penalties on the four wet leases that were over the limit. They had eight wet leases and they paid the penalty on four. Um, the, other interesting part of, of the current language is that they get to choose which four they pay penalties on. They can say that well, they can take the least expensive ones as far as the penalty goes and use those. Um, a lot of this language has to do with um, historical and regular flying. So they get to decide what the pairing will look like that they pay. Um, there's just a lot, of, a lot of places in this that allow the company to um, manipulate how this payment will be made, and there's no actual limit on what they can actually wet lease. The other interesting part about this is, since they calculate this um, schedule to be added and brought into service, they don't calculate that until the end of the year, until after the year is over, actually. This letter's from February, and it's for 2015. So they calculate that value after the year is over. So they do the wet leases during the year, and then at the end of the year, they go, okay, well, how many airplanes we got left? Oh, okay, so we owe a penalty on those. It kind of goes to the fact that this penalty is not determining what they're thinking about when they talk about wet leases. This is an example, this is an example of where there was a net loss. Um, there was a, a net loss of two aircraft um, in, uh, between December of uh, 2019 and December of 2020. Um, the company operated 10 wet leases during the December bid period, so they owed penalties on eight. I already talked about uh, some of this, but the penalties are, there's no hard limits. The penalties are based on aircraft timing, or number of aircraft and timing. There's two and four months windows. Um, as I mentioned before, some of the penalties are due only on regular and historical flying. Some penalties are paid by the credit hour, some by the block hour. Um, but this last part's kind of important. The penalties are not paid until the contract is complete. So I know there's some scenarios about long-term uh, leases running around out there. The company doesn't like long-term leases. Uh, the only time they've really done a, a lease that was of any uh, 
over a year long, was the Atlas one recently, and um, the company basically admitted to us that they were strong-armed into that because they needed the lift and Atlas wanted a long-term deal. So Atlas basically forced them into, into agreeing to a long-term deal. FedEx tried to get out of it. Uh, the cost of exiting from it was higher than the cost of just using it, so they ended up finishing up that uh, Atlas uh, wet lease and it ends at the end of this bid period. And there's, they, didn't, they didn't wet lease any additional lift for last peak. They are not planning on any additional lift for this peak. The wet leasing has basically gone away as our uh, BLGs have, have come down. Um, so what's the new TA do? There actually is a hard restriction on wet leasing in the new TA, or in the TA. Uh, it's, they are not allowed to enter into new, extended, or renewed wet leases during 4A2C. Uh, then when the company's position right now is if they were to go into a furlough, they could remain in 4A2C. If they chose to do that, then this uh, would prevent them from entering into or in, into any new wet leases. Um, we've already talked about the fact that they don't like long-term wet leases. Then once we're in a furlough, if that were to happen, there would be a penalty on every hour of wet leasing. And that penalty would go to the pilots who are actually out on furlough. Penalty payments are based on a percentage of last year's block hours adjusted for a net aircraft addition. So these are last year's numbers. The company cannot manipulate them. We'll know what they are going in. And we'll know how many wet lease hours they've used because they have to tell us that in their quarterly reports. So this payment is much more transparent. It's easier for us to verify that they're paying us for what they um, have used. And they actually have to pay the penalty annually in the first quarter of every fiscal year. So we've made it so they can't manipulate the numbers and delay payments. We've seen how they delay payments with this Atlas deal. I mean, we've waited and waited and waited and they just, they stall, they do whatever. This, this new language forces them to pay in that first quarter and they, so they can't play the games that they played with those Atlas payments uh, here recently. There's been some question about uh, the one B9 letter that was added, or not added, but it was included on the TA webpage. Um, that one B9 letter had to do with what we did in that section, that section has to do with reports that FedEx has to apply or supply to us on any kind of interline, uh, belly freight, uh, those kind of things. We wanted to make sure that we had access to information regarding that kind of, of uh, code sharing. And so we put in that language that we could specifically ask about 1B4 freight. The letter came about because the company was concerned about what we put in the contract, and they wanted to limit that to um, specific requests. So they, they wrote this letter to, to say that what we meant to say was that this is, this is just a specific request on a specific can going on a specific airplane. Um, we put that, or we initially came in, and we wanted to make that much broader and make it a report on it. They were unwilling to do that, but we did get this language in there that codifies our ability to ask questions about this 1B4 freight, and it, um, it will allow us to set up maybe a, a task force where we can watch for these cans going on other airplanes and set up our own database and try to figure out exactly what FedEx is doing as far as this belly freight goes. Why is that important? Well, when we go into scope, it's a complicated section, as we can all see from the, the um, misunderstandings on what the language says right now. So when we fix scope, we need to make sure we fix it so it stayed fixed. We need to make sure that we allow FedEx to do the things with, with wet leasing and with belly freight that makes sense for the business. We all know that belly freight has brought cities on that our pilots are now flying. Johannesburg, Nairobi, there are a lot of others. Wet leasing has done the same thing in a lot of cases. They start out with belly freight, then they may move to wet leasing and then they put our pilots on it. That's historically been what's happened. If you can look back at our history, and the only times that they've ever paid these penalties is when the airline was growing, when they were hiring pilots, buying airplanes, making the airline bigger. So if we want to fix this section so that it stays fixed, we need to make sure that we have the data so that we can allow them to do the things that bring business to us and create pilot jobs and prevent them from doing the things that take away pilot jobs. <coughs> Excuse me. So we feel like what we've done here is we've added real restrictions when business is bad or when, when the BLGs are coming down, 
but we've uh, allowed them to do the wet leasing that actually provides uh, jobs and helps to grow the airline. None of these restrictions were in the current language. The current language is just a penalty. We talked about how the company doesn't really even factor in that penalty when they're doing their wet leases. They're not even sure what it is when they, when they enter into these wet leases. So we feel like that this section, although some people are, are characterizing it as a loss, this section actually puts limitations in on the company, real limitations that we can enforce. It forces them to actually pay the penalty rather than allowing them to delay it, what could be in perpetuity. I mean, and I think we can all imagine a scenario where if they entered into a long-term lease, extend it, extend it, and never have to make a payment at all. To us, that didn't seem like the best solution. So we came up with this new language to prevent that from happening. And the bottom line is most of these discussions about wet leasing, wet leasing we know from the company is twice as expensive. It's at least 15% less reliable. That's with our best partner, which is Atlas. Why would the company use wet leasing to replace our pilots if it costs twice as much and it's at least 15% less reliable? Um, so I get the good news. What does a rejected TA look like? And it's, um, you know, it's something we do in our daily jobs. We assess risk. We don't ever go headlong into um, an emergency. We don't not have a backup plan. We always have a backup plan. We look long and hard at our alternates. Um, I think this TA that's sitting in front of you today is very much like that. And as professional aviators, uh, you'll certainly, I'm sure you will take a look, a hard look at what's in the TA for you and your family. Um, and if you're considering voting no, you have to ask the next question, and that's then what? Um, you know, the no lanyard thing is interesting, um, but somebody ought to be wearing a then what lanyard um, because that's a real question. So let's just step through it, um, analyze it, give you our feedback from what we've seen uh, from rejected TAs in the industry, our unique experience here with this mediator um, under this newly negotiated TA. So what does delay look like um, as far as the NMB getting back to the table? Well, we were clearly um, given a signal by the mediator in the last week of negotiation that if we couldn't get to a TA, if we couldn't come to an agreement, then we were likely to see a significant delay, one where we wouldn't get back to the table and mediated talks until after Labor Day. After I go through this, I'll ask Art to come up and speak to you about his view and reflect on how that looked compared to, say, Delta. Um, the other thing is, you know, the consideration of what's been done and how we got to this point, how we were able to take a massive thing like our, our pension benefit and go in and basically restructure 28 for generations to come, that did not happen overnight. I think you certainly have a better idea of the work that went into it, and it really started back in 2017 when Mike and I um, started on that. So now the question is, well, if this TA isn't the right thing, where did, where did it miss? What was the issue? Um, and you have to ask structural questions. The MEC is tasked uh, as a fiduciary to say, all right, it was a miss. We need to survey and find out what the miss was. Um, and that's something that's going to take time and development. The amendable period recovery payment and both parties went in and negotiated an agreement in good faith. We strongly believe that we reached the goal in that tentative agreement. The company strongly believes that they gave everything in this agreement. They believed and believe today that this TA should be ratified. So they have the next likely question is, if the deal gets rejected, then what happens to that amendable period recovery payment? Who then starts to assume the payment for that. What side of the ledger does that fall on? Our position would be obviously to continue to try and increase due to negotiations that amendable period recovery payment, but you can imagine the company's position on that. The company's position would be the pilots rejected it, it's their delay, it's you, the union representation, you, you deal with the outcome there. Um, that's a fact of the bargaining table. The economic impact is important and it's quantifiable now. Um, 
the cost now on a delay or rejected TA is over $70 million a month in value to the pilots. $70 million a month, pay, benefits, and other ancillary items. So look at the market-based cash balance plan. The first dollars into that are the most important for the new hires. The younger you are, the more important those dollars are later in your career. So if we delayed this TA just by one year alone, then a new hire in that plan has the potential to have a loss of over $340,000 by the end of their career and retirement benefits. That more than doubles for a two-year delay. For pilots retiring under the legacy plan, the improved legacy plan, not what's in the TA today, but the improved legacy plan, it's irrecoverable. The losses are irrecoverable. The value of that increased benefit that brings our pension to $169,000 a year, the additive value on top of the $130,000 pension, just that piece, the additive value, is over $540,000 for a pilot. Depending on their age, it goes higher, but that's the least amount. And that's just a cash equivalent value. In other words, if a pilot wanted to go out today and purchase an annuity for their family, that was the equivalent of $39,000 in annuity for life, which, and also had a survivor benefit in that annuity, pilots are being quoted anywhere from $800,000 to a $1 million to purchase that annuity for life. So the $575,000 value in here is just the cash equivalent. That's not going out. You can go today. You can log in, go to annuity.com, and you can find out how much that annuity is worth on your own. So the other piece, and this was one that we really, again, we tried to invest a lot of time to turn the ship around a little bit in terms of the career, the potential career delays or stagnation as a result of the, as a result of the system bid. And one of those things we did at the end is we really tried to incentivize pilots from retiring off the top, and that's why we ended up negotiate, negotiating that 28F side letter. The 28F side letter allows pilots to reestablish a new retirement date and not forego the sick leave buyback money, the bonus money that they may have qualified for as well in the prior chart. So we do believe strongly that pilots will come off the top and in, in a pretty rapid succession initially, and we're likely to see greater numbers than what would ordinarily retire into the deal. And for pilots that have a longer duration that may have looked at the new deal and said, I'm ready to go now, um, they're going to have to reassess whether or not they want to pull papers or whether they're just going to hang out until the next deal is done. So, you know, and that starts to cross into, well, what will the company want to come back to the table with? Will the company's openers look like they originally opened? Well, I can tell you when the company opened this, they were understaffed. Their considerations are renewed now, and it's corporate-wide uh, reconsideration of their structure, their cost savings model, their ultra focus on the, the bottom line, their balance sheet going forward. And we can certainly expect the company to readdress the amount of money that's been paid here in this TA added value for our pilots. Right now, their goal is to save an additional $4 billion in the next few years as a result of Drive and Network 2.0. And that's not all aimed at Express, but a good portion of it is and how they realign their business in the network. So will, will their opener remain the same? Will retirement still be on the table the way it is today? And I think all of that has to certainly be thought through and reasoned. Um, but I think there's certainly something else up at the senior level of the executive management that is putting an awful lot of pressure down through each of the network, each of the operating companies to manage those costs. So I think we hit this timing wise just right. And the loss has to be measured. When I say it's 70 million, over 70 million per month, that's measured against the current TA because that's really the benefit you're saying you're willing to live with. That's the benefit you're saying today is okay. And then what we have to do is look across the industry. And I think there's a, a variety of examples out there for us to look at and evaluate and consider. And when I say it's quantifiable, it is. You can talk to Delta pilots. We've talked to the negotiating committee. MEC members talk. And we can talk about their process and what they went through and their near 18 month delay getting back and getting a TA out in front of their pilots. And unfortunately, 
our united brothers and sisters are still in that fight. Even though their CEO has been out there telling them, this is how much we're promising to bring to the table, it hasn't produced those results yet, as far as I know, because there's not a TA that's been announced there. So now here they are five years into negotiations with the rejected TA. And we wish them the best of luck. But you need to consider some of these things as you consider the then what side of the no lanyard. Um, Art has far more experience than I do in this area in dealing with uh, the National Mediation Board and the mediators. Um, I, I just want to bring him up and let him provide his perspective on that. Well, I would add this in relation to the Delta experience and as it pertains to what we're going through right now. Uh, at Delta, uh, at the request of ALPA, we engaged in a very aggressive mediation schedule. We were in mediation face-to-face -face after the COVID restrictions ended two weeks out of every month. Um, and the mediator, who um, was Jane Allen, uh, spent a lot of time and effort. The final week was convened in Raleigh uh, in late November of last year. And uh, during the course of the first four days of that week, at our urging and, after, and under our pressure, really, um, and I'm talking about the negotiating committee's pressure, of which I was uh, the primary advisor, um, or the senior advisor, uh, the, uh, the company added $1.5 billion in value during the course of those four days. Uh, the negotiating committee was concerned that it still didn't meet the guidelines set by the MEC, but after she had spent that amount of time pressuring the company and in consultation with the chairperson of the board, Linda Pachella, uh, the mediator came back to us and said, look, she had taken this as far as she's gonna take it or could take it. And if it wasn't, uh, the board regarded it as one of the richest deals ever negotiated. And if it wasn't good enough, then she was gonna recess negotiations and that um, they would be reconvened late January or early February the following year in the chairperson's office to go over what it is that we felt that we needed. But she couldn't vouch for what the schedule would be after that. So we were faced with a major significant recess and we went back to the um, MEC and the MEC by a close vote allowed us to enter into the AIP. Um, later when we came back with the language uh, they, um, it was not nearly as close a vote, and the membership, of course, ratified it. Uh, but the point that we had to make is that the consequences of not putting the deal out or of not ratifying it would have been a major delay for a board that is strapped even back then of significant resources in which to conduct mediation. Um, this time around, uh, we also, towards uh, um, in May and in April, had a pretty aggressive negotiating schedule with a very experienced mediator who was pretty sympathetic to us. And during the course of Lowe's last few weeks, he added um, or persuaded the company to add, at our urging, um, well over a half a billion dollars worth of value. Um, once the, he had persuaded the company to do that, and the company bridged more than 80% of the gap between the parties through what it added, he told us and he told them, look, to me, this is the basis for a deal. If it's not good enough, I have other negotiations that I have to administer and I have to officiate. I'm just gonna have to recess you guys until at the earliest after Labor Day uh, because I, I've done everything I can do. So at that point, uh, looking at the other side, as we did at Delta, and looking at him, we believed that we had gotten as far as we were gonna get. Now, if obviously, people have the right to vote yay or nay for whatever reason they like. Uh, that's wholly your decision. But on the other hand, uh, if in fact the contract doesn't go through, uh, we will probably be reconvened in the chairperson's office who will ask us what we need 
Um, she will make her own assessments as to whether they are realistic demands. Uh, as I said, she has no authority to compel us to agree to anything, but she does have the authority to set the schedule of negotiations. And the board now will have three senior mediators who have either retired or are on the verge of retirement and have far less resources. So I am not confident that we will have an aggressive schedule. It is unlikely we'll have an aggressive schedule uh, because I don't think the board has the resources to do that. And the other thing is that I am not optimistic that if we asked for a release, we would get one. The last release, my basis for believing that is not any inside information. My basis for believing that is the last release of a pilot group in this industry was at Spirit in 2010, and that was after three years of, uh, or three and a half years after the amendable date. So um, uh, I'm not optimistic about that, and uh, my own assessment is that the closer you get to a presidential election year, the less likely a release is. That's just sort of a standard rule of thumb. Uh, so we do have those issues, those are realities. I'm not speculating about that. Um, and it's something uh, that should, uh, it is something for you to consider as you discuss the consequences to your career and your family of whatever your vote is. <laughs> All the aerodynamics majors certainly got that really quick. Look, um, I think what we should be proud of is the fact that in spite of all the current conditions at FedEx, in spite of their historical restructure, in spite of the fact that they're actually and unfortunately laying off thousands of their own employees across their, their divisions of freight, uh, ground, and even express, that we were able to put this deal in place. The, the ground shifted continuously. Um, I don't think any, any of us could have ever predicted the end game environment that we would be dealing with. Uh, certainly, FedEx thought that they would be dealing with UPS pay rates throughout the whole thing, and we kept warning them that they wouldn't be. Um, I think we ended up achieving, clearly, the best retirement in the industry, bar none. We've raised the bar for the rest of our brothers and sisters throughout the industry. Um, the MEC, we have found, is a very accurate predictor of the pilots, and they should be. They're your elected officers. They represent the most junior block to the most senior block. They re represent the outer domiciles, foreign domiciles, and block 11, the instructors and flex instructors and LCAs. Um, so we're confident we hit the right mark because we passed that threshold, and that threshold with those representatives were extremely high. I'm also confident we are at the right spot because of the slide that's over my shoulder, both sides. We have hit L over D max, and the time portion of it is very interesting because the, continue, the, the longer you continue along that line, the longer this goes, the harder it is to maintain the value that you've had. And if we would try to squeeze out another, let's, Labor Day was the earliest we'd get back, how much more would we get? Would it be three more dollars on a pay rate? Would it be another $50 on the amendable period recovery payment? But that delay, that value and lost money starts to become real. And at a certain point, there's a crossover where you're not going to end up achieving improved results that were worth the time waiting to get there. And that's why I say that this TA, this TA absolutely has hit L over D max. So for that reason, obviously, we strongly endorse it and we hope you do as well.